Um, so we ought to start with the, you know, we ought to start with what this really is. And um, the, uh, there you go, that's it. Talk done. <laughs> All right. So, slightly more helpfully, the more precise the position is determined, the less precise the momentum is known in this instant, and vice versa. And we get a whole load of fascinating quantum mechanics uh, interpretations that flow from this. Um, and the challenges normally centre around when people sort of talk about the uncertainty principle: is it something fundamental in the nature of the universe? Um, I'm going to sort of shy away from the fundamental nature of the universe stuff um, here and really talk about the role of uncertainty in terms of how humans go about making decisions, or to be precise, I'm, I'm just in one particular class of human, software developers. Uh, it's also to remind you that software developers are in fact human. Sometimes the evidence appears to contradict that, but no, no we have evidence in favour of that. Um, and I'm interested in that. And, uh, but nonetheless, whenever people start talking about quantum mechanics and uncertainty, they always invoke um, Schrodinger's um, cat. And there's a rather uh, cruel thought experiment um, about knowing whether or not the cat is alive or dead. Uh, and what you do is you put the cat in a box. I don't know whether you give it enough oxygen or not. That's another question. Put a cat in a box. And you, in, the, in the box, you also put some uh, radioactive isotope. And you uh, connect up a Geiger counter to um, either a gun or a, um, a mechanism for releasing poison. And um, then there's a 50-50 probability in some interval of time that, the, um, uh, that what will actually happen is that the, uh, uh, there will be a decay event. It will be detected and the cat will be killed in one way or another. And the question then comes is after this period of time, is the cat alive or dead? And the answer is yes. And we have this kind of superposition of wave states and so on. Now, uh, you yeah, know, this is all very well and not, not necessarily particularly helpful to us in our everyday interpretation of things. And it's also a little bit cruel to cats, even thought cats, you know. Um, so this is uh, taken from, uh, this is a comic, Animal Man, uh, uh, I, it's not a comic that I follow, but it's a, a friend of mine sort of, uh, uh, we were having one of these late night conversations and he mentioned, oh yeah, I saw this comic, Animal Man. He, he went and got it for me for a, a Christmas present. Um, uh, this, this is great because here what we're dealing with is something that's much more humane and closer to people's experience. Schrodinger's pizza. As you can see, it's, it's shimmering in a wave of uncollapsed wave vectorness, of ambiguity. Did the take, did the pizza order, did they remember to put the extra cheese and pineapple on or not? Until you open the box, it's in a quantum superposition of states that cannot be resolved until that point. So this is much nicer than cats and much more useful um, from an everyday uh, example. Now, how does all this relate to software? Uh, it's ultimately about finding out about things that are not known. How do we find out about this stuff? We have the normal way in which people focus on um, software development anatomy is either very much a point of view of uh, code is, um, uh, we look at the progress of the code. Other people use financial and economic arguments to structure a development life cycle. Um, some people structure a development life cycle in terms of artifacts. I have got much more interested in the idea of software development as a form of learning. Um, basically, we know very little at the beginning. Okay, we're going to undertake some development. That the moment we start in on that project, the moment we join some product team, the moment we get involved, is the point at which we have the least knowledge. Or to spin it the other way, it's the point of greatest ignorance. The point of greatest knowledge is at the point at which we leave or leave the project or at which we release the project or sometime after. Yeah? The point of greatest knowledge comes later. What we need to do is understand that the learning is a natural flow. That's going to happen. There is a natural flow. And that we will be uncertain from the very start about things. We will continue to be uncertain as we progress. What we need to do is organize the life cycle around the lack of knowledge that we have 
and the process of discovering. This is very different to the way that people structure it. I will actually point out another difference in a little bit um, in terms of schools of thought, and I only really, really just occurred to me only in the last few weeks. But this idea, though, relates back to um, the first talk, for those of you that were here. The first talk um, today, I talked about sustainable software architecture, and I used a, uh, a definition of architecture that comes from Grady Booch, and it was about, it related architecture to the significance of design decisions. And the key point here is that you would like your software development process to be sympathetic to your ignorance. You would like it to accommodate the fact that you don't know. You don't want to be put in a position where you end up making the critical decisions at the period at which you know least. Okay? Um, many software development life cycles are structured to make sure that you make the critical decisions at the point where you are actually ill-qualified to make them. And that's unfortunate. It's a contradiction there, and a contradiction that we need to address. Because uncertainty comes with it. With uncertainty, there is risk. You're not sure of what framework you're going to use. You're not sure of how to design this individual class. You're not sure about the customer's particular requirement. You're not sure about whether to go for one UI option or another. You're not sure about the storage solution. You're not sure. There's all of these uncertainties. What people normally do when they're confronted with this is they make arbitrary decisions, arbitrary point decisions as opposed to set decisions. A set is a number of points. A point is just one. They make arbitrary decisions. And the reason they do this is nothing magical. There's no, there's no bad reason. It's not because they're malicious. It turns out that it's exactly the same in other domains where humans get involved. People are often very uncomfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty, so they feel the need to make something certain. And the idea comes out that any decision is better than no decision. And in fact, that's actually a stated policy in, in some cases of project management, of military uh, operations, and certain, so on. And I'm going to say, you know what? That's not the best way of looking at it. Not any decision is not better than uh, uh, no decision. Some decisions are genuinely worse than others. What we need is a way of structuring this. We would like to take the fact that we don't know about something as being more profound. Rather than saying, I don't know about it, I must make a decision, or I must find out enough to make a decision, and make a decision quickly. It's more important to make the decision than to recognize the fact that we don't know is maybe interesting. Why don't we know about this? Why are we uncertain about it? Why do we have, why do we have two options? What if we choose one and it turns out to be the other? This is far, far deeper than the actual individual options themselves. But of course, engaging in uncertainty reveals uh, and exposes us to risk. Now, sometimes people use the words uncertainty and risk and risky to mean the same thing. You need to manage risk within the development life cycle, and uncertainty is part of that. Uncertainty, risk is exposure to uncertainty. So let me, let me um, uh, take a, a different example um, uh, to demonstrate this. Um, let's say that I went and bet, uh, I bet, I don't know, let's see, tomorrow's Saturday, so there's bound to be horse races somewhere, and, I, um, and there's a betting shop near my house. So let's just say I broke the habit of a lifetime, walked in, and said, okay, on the 3.15 this afternoon, I'll put some money down on that horse, that one there, the one with a really stupid name, yeah? Uh, I'll see if I can find a horse called the Uncertainty Principle, or Heisenberg, something like that. Yeah, um, Schrodinger's horse, even better. So, uh, so I go in and I put down some money. Now, I have there is uncertainty over whether or not the horse will win. My ten pounds is my risk. There is I've exposed myself to some risk. Um, I could come out very well. On the other hand, I could come out quite badly. Well, no, I couldn't. The most I can stand to lose is the, is the, I was going to say, 10 pounds. Well, let me think, that's about, you know, 200 milliliters of Norwegian beer, isn't it, at current prices? Uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe about, yeah, maybe, maybe about that, yeah, that much, that much beer. No, even that's a bit too much. So, you know, it's not exactly what, you know, you can see it's not a big risk. If I don't put any money at all, on the um, uh, uh, on the horse, then there is no risk to me whatever. But we have exactly the same uncertainty. If instead I go and 
put on, I don't know, I, I go and put our house as collateral on that. The risk is enormous, especially for my wife. So the point there is that the risk, the uncertainty is the same in each case. But the risk, what would happen with this? So we, what we're looking to do is to structure, to use the fact that we don't know something as a way of helping us structure the system to reduce the risk. It won't necessarily reduce the uncertainty, but it may reduce the risks. So this is what we're exploring. Normally people treat decisions in this kind of like red pill, blue pill way. Okay, so, oh, you've got to take one. Oh, and the, what are the consequences? What are the risks? And so on. Yeah, you take the blue pill, everything goes back to normal, and you forget you're ever developing software. You take the red pill, and you'll find yourself in a world of middleware and craziness that bears no reality to the world you've come to experience. So it's not like that, we're, but this is the way that sometimes we see this or that, this or that. Maybe it's because we work with Boolean too much. Yeah? We just think, oh, it's got to be one or the other. So let's look at this. So this is um, taken from uh, my contribution to uh, 97 Things Every Software Architect Should Know. Um, confronted with two options, most people think that the most important thing to do is make a choice between them. In design, and it's not just software design to emphasize, it is not. Presence of two options is an indicator that you need to consider uncertainty. It doesn't make uncertainty go away by making a decision. What you may do is mask the uncertainty. That's actually, that's like sweeping it under the carpet. The uncertainty is still there. Making a decision was not the goal. Use the uncertainty as a driver to determine where you can defer commitment to details and where you can partition and abstract to reduce the significance of design decisions. The point here is we're going to use the fact that we don't know something as a way of helping structure the system. So it, it applies to trivial things. It also applies to larger things. Should we use an array? Or should we use a collection for that? I don't know. Right, so at this point, you do not get out the world-famous decision-making structure. Yeah, we have two options, we can choose. That's not the way you do it. Alternatively, you engage in a, in a futile argument with one of your colleagues about which option is better, and you can spend a good half hour, one hour doing this, e or even longer and justifying why it should be this way or that way and this, that and the other and then running across that question of like, yes, but if there's no result, do we return an empty array or do we return a null and you know, getting up, caught up in all those questions. The point there is what you want to do is take a step back and say, wait a minute, how would we retake this decision in a way that allowed it, made the decision irrelevant or reduced the relevance of it? So what you're doing is using the fact that you don't know to structure the boundaries of encapsulation and separation. You're actually using this. Rather than thinking in terms of a very purist idea, the data is private, yeah, that, that helps us to some degree. But what we're actually looking here is a, a different way. How should I structure my class hierarchy? Don't know. Tell you what, how could we rearrange this so it didn't matter? That's a good question. We ask the question differently. We ask it so that we push things back. Now, don't confuse this with the kind of the vague speculation that sometimes uh, uh, we can end up uh, getting uh, trapped into. Um, this quote from um, Martin Fowler's book, Refactoring. Uh, Brian Foote suggested this name for a smell to which we are very sensitive. You get it when people say, oh, I think we need the ability to do this kind of thing someday, maybe. And thus want all sorts of hooks and special cases to handle things that aren't required. And I'm sure you come across code like this where you're dealing with the code, you're looking at the code, and then there's some kind of option on you do this and you do that. And indeed, the guesswork is actually the guesswork that's involved, this idea of trying to predict the future, has ended up in something that is significantly more complex than a far simpler solution that, uh, that we would normally favor. Because somebody is trying to second guess the future, because they are uncertain. Almost in these cases, what you end up with is the problem when a um, it's almost like a, a, an interviewee. You're in an interview situation and you get a little bit nervous. A couple of things happen when people get nervous. For some people, they just dry up. They just become quiet. For other people, they, you just can't shut them up. And then they babble incessantly and say all kinds of nonsense. The same happens with code. I'm not sure. That can lead to a kind of analysis paralysis. I don't know how to approach this. I'm just not sure. Nothing happens for long periods of time. The other case is, I'm not sure, so we'll put this option in, we'll put this option in, blah, 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 shut up! No, 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 I'm just putting in another method because we might need this someday. 
you get designs like that. They look the uncertainty in this case, it's curious, is actually passed on. Rather than solving the problem, what's actually happened is that the author unintentionally has passed on their uncertainty, their unhappiness with the situation has now been passed on to whoever's going to use that code. But now we have more of it to deal with. We're even less certain than we were before. Many interfaces and many frameworks that offer these extra options, you're actually left more confused than before. You look at something and you think, I've got five different ways of traversing this collection. Which one is the right way? It's no longer obvious because somebody sort of said, well, maybe if you want to do it like this, you might want to use an iterator, or maybe you want to use a callback, or maybe you want to do this, or maybe you want to hook it up with link, or maybe you want to do, who knows? Well, uh, let's back all of them. Yeah, the uncertainty becomes verbose. It, it creates a lot of accidental complexity. Um, it's like a, I, I, I wish I'd lost the link, but it was years ago, maybe I can recover it. There was this, um, failure to commit and somebody's coding guidelines they said if you provide a method called size to determine the size of a collection you should also provide a method called length and one called get size and one called get length because you just never know really people might like it the other way or maybe they will you know maybe when I arrive at the airport this evening I'll see if I can find myself an airplane that you know maybe has extra wings because maybe that would be kind of cool but uh, no the point there is that a design is a commitment it's something that of course somebody can change but you need your uncertainty does not make it easier for somebody else it actually makes it harder you present them with more choices than they necessarily need so we're not talking about speculative generality we are talking about genuinely saying you know I don't know about this I've got a choice here and we're going to come to another choice that we have one of the choices is clearly, let's restructure it so the question goes away or gets moved back one level so that when we retake that, it doesn't affect all of this code over here. But there's another thing. We can push it away through time as well as uh, spatially. So here what we want to make sure of is that we don't fall for the speculative generality. And it's a very fine line we need to, uh, 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 to, to walk on this one. So when we're looking for generality, and this is a quote from the other item I uh, contributed to this, best route to generality is through understanding known specific examples and focusing on their essence to find essential, an essential common solution. So the idea is that you use the examples that you have to determine the variability. What kind of variability might we have? We might have past experience of this. Oh, yeah, that always changes. Okay. But if you just use, oh, that might change, there are lots of things that might change. Just speculating on those and obsessing about those sometimes distracts us from the real issues. So um, in one particular case, the uh, sort of uh, helping somebody with, with, with some code, and they, ha they had a particular way of forming their class hierarchies. And I thought this was a b bizarre way because it made the class hierarchies very, very complex. Um, and I thought, you know, wh why are you doing this? You, you're fattening up the class hierarchy with all these extra methods that you need to override or not in certain cases. Uh, what's going on? This class hierarchy, you should just be rooting it in a simple interface, and yet it's much more complex. And the, the response came, which this relates to a broader discussion I've had, but I'll pick on one particular person that I have in mind. And the response came, well, you know, it might make it easier to refactor if we need it to change. Well, <laughs> might make it easier to refactor to what? I think it's making it harder. Oh, yes, but let's say you wanted to refactor to the template method pattern, then it would be easier. Okay, now, I've written, um, I've written a number of patterns in my time. Um, and I've co-authored two books on patterns. I've lost count of how many patterns I have either written directly or indirectly, but it's probably, let's just say it's a couple of hundred, okay? Now I'm sitting there thinking that's a couple of hundred. Other people, other members of the patterns community have also written many patterns. There are many patterns that have been documented, so let's call it a few thousand. And what I found fascinating was that this person was saying, well, you know, if I structure my class hierarchies this way, I don't know if I'm going to need to change it, but if I do change it, then this makes it really easy to refactor to the template method pattern. That's one pattern. One pattern out of thousands. Why did we pick that one? Are we fond of it? Is it special? Did it do us a favor in the past? Why is it we picked that one pattern? Why not one of the other ones and say, you know, I'm going to totally distort my class hierarchy so that that pattern, yes, I choose you, it's easier to refactor to that if we need to. What's so special about a template method pattern? I will say, just as an aside, that in the um, Poser 4, uh, Pattern Oriented Software Architecture Volume 4, uh, where we talked about um, distributed um, systems, 
that in Poser 4, we had the template method pattern in there, standard gang of four pattern, and we used a star rating. Star rating is a confidence rating of how strongly you reckon this pattern applies or how much confidence you offer in that pattern. It was originally used by Christopher Alexander in his book, A Pattern Language, where he talks about towns and buildings. And his star rating system was you know, basically no stars, one star, two star. And in, in, in our model, basically two stars is we have high confidence in this pattern for the applicability in this system. One star is, yes, this pattern is applicable, it does solve problems, but you may find an alternative. It says nothing of the qualities of the pattern in other systems, though, in other kinds of systems. You may find it more useful elsewhere. But you're saying, for what we're building here, yeah, this can be used, um, but always keep your eye open for alternatives. And then zero stars is this pattern, it's a little bit speculative, or be careful. You know, really be careful with this one. There's, it's got some edge cases. It might be leading you, in the, uh, leading you into more complexity. So we did simple star rating of the patterns. Template method got one star. Didn't get two stars. Strategy, or plugin, got two stars. We favored that as an architectural style. So when somebody says, I'm structuring my class hierarchy like this, you're saying, but that makes it more complex. Yes, it makes it more complex, but if we needed to refactor to template method, which is a low ranking pattern in our language, then it would make it easier. Why would I want to do that? This is the blind alley down which some uncertainty can lead you. People sort of focus on that. Template method, refactoring template method is not the problem that they need to solve. It's the fact that they are not sure about how the class hierarchy is used, that they are taking completely the wrong approach to the class hierarchy. So at this point, it's worth taking a step back and, uh, and um, appreciating unknown pleasures, I guess. Uh, Joy Division, classic album. Um, what can we do with uh, the unknown? Well, the first thing we can do with um, the unknown is to classify it. This is uh, Philip Armour's classification of um, ignorance, the five orders of ignorance. This appeared in communications of the ACM a couple of years ago. Uh, I love this one. It's great. Um, five orders of ignorance. Of course, it starts at zero, as all things should. Yeah. Which is why I'm constantly thrown off whenever I come to Norway by the uh, floor numbering. Because over here in Norway, you use Fortran numbering. Yeah, I, always, I always say that because it makes people feel, oh, Fortran, that's dirty. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. uh, and I've had an interesting experience. Met, oh, when was it? it was about five, six, six years ago, I stayed at a hotel. I booked online. And uh, I walked into the hotel. And, the, um, and uh, you know, I did the mental switch. The receptionist. You know, greeted me, and uh, she's obviously seen the information. Oh, he's from Britain, and I'm there. I'm in Norway. Okay. So what happens is that she gives me my key for my room, and she says, "This is on the sixth floor, room seven one four." And she says, "And uh, the breakfast will be on the first floor," and uh, and uh, and I'm looking around, thinking, "No, there's a big sign that points to the second floor." She had switched for me. And I had switched because I was in Norway. I recalibrated, so had she. Yeah, we talked past each other quite successfully. Um, it's one of those things, if you lose a child in a supermarket, one of you has to stay still. Okay? So starting at zero, lack of ignorance. Or to put it another way, you know something. Okay? You know what you know. So I know that um, I can speak English. There we go. One, lack of knowledge. You know that you don't know something. I know that I can't speak Norwegian. Well, I can order a beer. That's okay, that's good enough in most things, isn't it? And I can count to ten, so I can get more than one beer. <laughs> but given the prices here, would I want to? Yeah? Um, so you know what you know. And you know what you don't know. Right. Now it starts getting tricky, although I will say many developers break down after zero. Yeah. Um, there is a, um, what we can say there's probably a bimodal distribution. You get this when you interview somebody. And originally when this came up, uh, there, there is a paper on this. I, I don't have the link to hand. I can't remember what the appropriate phrase is uh, to look for are. But it's about how people can be oblivious to the the fact that they don't know something. They're unaware that they're, well, put it another way, it also relates to skill. Sometimes people just don't know that they're not good at something. 
Yeah? They just don't know how crap they are, even when all the evidence is laid out before them. Um, you may, and what <laughs> this did the rounds. I remember when this one came, this, this, uh, this paper caught people's attention on a number of lists because, hey, yeah, we all know programmers like this. And you know what? I reckon half the programmers that responded were probably in that category. And you will get this when you interview. Yeah? This is inevitable. Sometimes it's a personality, but also it's, it's a deep reflection of the fact that we don't like that kind of uncertainty. You don't know what um, you don't know. And I remember this notion of you know, rank yourself. So that we originally came up um, many years ago in the context of, I think it was, what, it was about 10 years ago, in the context of C++. Um, you're interviewing a C++ developer, and you ask them to rank themselves on, you know, a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of their knowledge of the language. And, you know, like 1 is your grandmother and, and 10 is Bjarne Straustra, yeah? So, you know, that kind of scale. And what is fascinating, and the, the, the guy who originally made, made this point on the list, he's, you know, he's moved around a lot of languages, he's moved around a lot of different domains, and he uses the same basic model each time. And he's fascinated by the number of sevens and eights he gets. The number of people that will rank themselves very, very highly, and then when you actually, and maybe they assume that it wasn't a continuous scale or something. You know, it went, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight point one, nine hundred, forty-three. You know, a number of points, and then ten. Yeah. Uh, maybe they assume this, or maybe that it was wildly logarithmic. You know, there's a massive, there's a world of difference between eight and eight point three. It's far larger than the difference between 1 and 8. So, but he's found this fascinating. They were unable to answer the simplest questions, but quite happily went, yep, 8. And then what happens is that, now sometimes people plateau at that, but sometimes that's just simply a reflection of what we don't, you know, we don't know how much we don't know. Then as you start working with that, you suddenly realize, you know, I, I really don't know this. I appreciate what I don't know now. And the number goes down. You ask the same person two years later, they've gone down to a 5. They stick at it for a few more years. They go back up to an eight. But now their eight is a, from a different point of view. So people are not very good at knowing what they don't know. Then we hit two, lack of awareness. This, is, this was captured, maybe it was his only useful contribution to um, uh, the, the sum of uh, human knowledge. Donald Rumsfeld, the, um, the known unknowns are one. And the unknown unknowns, that's two. Lack of awareness. You don't know what you don't know. <sighs> now we're getting into the meta territory. Now this turns out to be challenging. Again, when we are engaged in code, there is stuff that we know about how we're going to build stuff. There is stuff that we do not know. And we may be comfortable with that. Oh, I know. I don't know enough about uh, how to use this tool. I'll go and talk to so-and-so. And, you know, they know. Yeah, and maybe I can learn something from them. Or, mm, I'm always a little uncomfortable when I'm doing this kind of thing with a database. I'm not really a database guy, so I'm, you know, I'll, I'll go and speak to somebody else. Or we're wandering into a territory that I don't really know. And you know, I could make up an answer. Or maybe there's a way of finding out an answer. So we have that. But the, the two is getting quite difficult. We don't actually know that we didn't know something. And watching yourself do that, you have to look for cues. A very typical cue for this is um, to see yourself going round in circles. You know, there's maybe two or three of you having a discussion about something and you go round in circles in your discussion. Or you don't seem to reach any conclusion, whether it's a conclusion about requirements or a conclusion about design. But it's very difficult to spot yourself getting dizzy. Yeah? Sometimes you have to kind of break the loop, which is, means, you know, um, uh, this is actually one of the, uh, one of the reasons that uh, coffee can be very uh, useful for dealing with uncertainty. Um, because eventually you will have to go to the toilet. And that can be the break in the stream of consciousness that you needed. You switch streams, so to speak. Um, and when you re-engage, it's just like, wait a minute, hang on. And indeed, I had this at one company where it was quite clear the three of us didn't really know the answer to something, but it wasn't clear to us. And I said, well, you know, maybe, do we have a user in the building that we can actually ask? Somebody who uses the current system. So there's me, a business analyst, and the chief developer. Get a, get a real user in. Do we have to wear rubber gloves or something? You know, but no, we found one. Uh, well, we brought her in. We gave her tea and biscuits. <laughs> no waterboarding was involved. And we got the knowledge. 
But it was first of all was to get that notion there. Because there's something else here that that touched on. Lack of process. What is lack of process? Lack of process is I don't know how to find out what I don't know. That's really tricky. But this was this notion of like, wait a minute, we are going in circles. We can't actually determine something. And if you like, a lot of programmer level decisions are sometimes made by this. Sometimes people will mistake something as a programming challenge, where actually it's a, a domain challenge. Or it is a genuine deep uncertainty about the business. And you can't just make it by saying, well, you know, I'll return this hard-coded number or whatever. People will do this. I get this all the time. This, I, it's one of the things I find most fascinating about when I uh, do training courses uh, and run workshops is that these are little microcosms of development. You can see people playing out the uncertainty. They don't know something. Um, you know, this whole notion of um, having, a, having a, an on-site available customer or a domain specialist available sometimes that actually still doesn't solve the problem because in a training course somebody is sitting here and I am here I'm only a couple of meters away and yet they won't ask when they don't know they will accidentally it's not because they're afraid to ask the habits are so strong to make a decision at that point whatever the decision and to drive it by the code rather than think about wait a minute does this relate to something else and we see this in this microcosm of these small hands-on labs in training courses that only last a couple of hours. When you stretch that out over a couple of years for a, a major development project, it's amplified. It doesn't go away. That same thought process actually continues. But now it's amplified into far, far greater proportions. And you get some very, very strange things sometimes. Um, and then we have level four, or order four, meta-ignorance. Meta-ignorance is you don't know about the five orders of ignorance. But now you can cross that one off. Yeah? But this idea is a very useful one when you're looking at something, a design decision, or testing something. How do I know how to test this? I mean, the, one of the classic ones um, when it comes to testing is if we look at testing from a defects point of view, how do you know you don't have any bugs in your system? Yeah, that's a very difficult question to answer. How would we, I mean, we have a lack of process there. We cannot infer that very, uh, we, we cannot determine that easily. You know, the, the classic Dijkstra quote is you can only ever determine the presence of bugs. You cannot determine their, you, you cannot guarantee their absence. So there's a curious thing here um, that with many of these other things, you're looking for external cues to bring you in. And so that notion with something like defects, and we're going to come back to defects in a moment, with something like defects, um, you can look at trends. So in other words, well, this many bugs were reported last month, this many bugs reported this month, and going back a few months, then we can kind of see that there's a convergence. So in theory, if it were not for the fact we had to do some new systems development in three months, we would reach something of the order of um, zero defects in three months' time if we were to continue this trend, assuming the trend is realistic, which actually takes us back to the first slide which, to remind you, was this. Even at rest, even zero does not exist in this model. Your uncertainty over the number of bugs, the number of defects, there's a kind of a hovering uncertainty. We can't actually guarantee that there is zero. There is a notion of zero-point energy. We cannot guarantee it's a true zero, even given all the trends. So it becomes an indicator. It doesn't become an actual definite value. Once we move to these other levels, things become relatively approximate. Now, with our ignorance, we, this is not just simply about the architectural view. We're going to come back to the code in a moment, because I want to look at something, um, one of the lean tools. Mary Poppendick uh, described this kind of approach in the original lean software development book, um, options thinking, the idea of deferring commitment. Uh, we're talking about lean, a, a slightly different take on the lean perspective just after lunch uh, and lean code. And there is a notion here that what you do is you defer decisions. Now, that sounds really very, very vague. You know, It's very much a manana approach. Ah, should we do this? Well, I don't know. Let's, do it, uh, let's figure it out tomorrow. Yeah? Leave it till tomorrow. Um, this doesn't sound like a very considered and rational approach it sounds like procrastination. In fact, I came across a, a word recently. Um, procrastinate literally means to put off until tomorrow. 
I found an even better word, perendinate. That means to put off until the day after tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, ever since I mentioned this to my wife, it came up on a word a day list. And, I, and it's just like, <laughs> she says, are you procrastinating or perendinating? It's just like, are you not really getting around to it? You're really not getting around to it. It's, uh, so now, I mean, this does sound like perendination. No, this is more structured. This is not, we're not absolving ourselves of responsibility. What we're actually doing is we are taking a decision to take a decision. It's more concrete. So it does go back to that notion of like, in some ways any decision is better than no decision. No, it isn't. The decision that you make when you have no decision that you can make with confidence is the decision about when you take the decision. We are going to defer this until such a time as we are able to make this decision reasonably confidently and with the right amount of knowledge. What we're doing is we're pushing things back because it may turn out that decision never needs to be taken. That's nice when that happens. It just goes away. Okay, I, uh, with one of my clients, they struggled over an interface. They really weren't sure about a particular interface. And when we nailed it down, I said, well, you know, this interface that you got here, I can't really see why you'd use it. Why is it there? Because we might need some functionality like this one day. But what's the requirement? Well, we're not sure yet. What code would you write now? We haven't. We don't. How would you write a test for this? Don't know. Why not? Because we don't have any requirements. Right. So we can keep going around and say, well, why don't you take the interface out? Well, we put it in to save time. And I said, well, the problem is that when the real requirement arrives, I bet it won't look like this. You're not saving time by doing this. You're actually, you, you think you're saving time, but that's not saving time. You're not actually laying a foundation for something that you know you need to build. You're genuinely uncertain about this. Why don't you just not put it in? But how can that help? Well, I said, if you don't put it in, then if the opportunity never arises, then that was cheap and that was easy. If the opportunity does arrive, if the requirement materializes and becomes concrete in a way that you can now write code, you no longer have any legacy code to deal with because you made the wrong guess. So in other words, you streamline the code, which means that it becomes easier to add rather than mutate. This is something we often overlook, is that there are some changes that are just easier to do by adding stuff to existing code, rather than take an existing code, work, change it into something that it was not. That tends to be a harder change. So the idea here is just don't put it in. That is the option that favors the future most strongly. So they did that. And a couple of years later, I asked them, how did that work out? You know, did you have an, that persistence requirement that you had? Oh, yeah, it went away. Bop, like a subatomic particle, just flitted out of existence. There it was. Or actually, like the functionality at, uh, at CERN for the Large Hadron Collider. Boop, multi-billion euro experiment, just ceased working. And there it was. So we had exactly that. The, the thing went away. The interface was no longer required. Having made that change early to get rid of the thing they put in, they were now far better prepared for the future by having taken it out. But had the requirement arisen, the knowledge would have come at the right time. So they took a decision to take a decision. This is options. Now, there is um, a group and a way of thinking known as the real options um, approach. And real options are, you can kind of tell it's colored by um, the background. It's... Uh, some folks who deal with financial options, software and financial options, have kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of tried to apply the same reasoning to real world, the idea that not taking a decision actually has value in itself. And it's, again, a risk management approach. And they tend to refer to this as real options. Now, what is interesting is that the vocabulary is slightly different. Last responsible moment, LRM, um, is an idea, is a terminolo is terminology that you'll find in the uh, sort of uh, classic lean software development book. I still prefer it. They often refer to the optimal exercise point, which sounds much more jargony. Um, and what I find interesting is there is a difference here between how I perceive this and how they perceive it. The arguments for the real options people tend to be structured around the money and the risk associated with money. In other words, although they're calling it real options, it's still actually a financially driven uh, structure. I've always tended to look at the last responsible moment as very much what it is responsibility, the ability to take a decision. Now, of course, the last responsible moment is not fixed. It may move, and you may actually have more than one responsible moment. 
This is a point that Chris Matz, a real options guy, often makes. There may be more than one. But I tend to look at it in terms of knowledge rather than money. Um, you're looking for the point of greatest possible knowledge combined with the point of greatest possible opportunity. Now, the point of greatest possible knowledge is, is going to be right at the end. The point of least opportunity is right when you need to deliver. You have no opportunity to change things. So what we're looking here is a balance. So with one client, we, we had this discussion based on this kind of structure. Um, I'll keep the numbers simple. The, the original deadline was four months out, so let's call it 16 weeks. And they said, okay, so we have to migrate our database from Oracle to SQL Server, and we had, they had a bunch of other changes to do. Um, they had just been given maintenance of this system. Now, this is interesting. This team had been given maintenance of a system. Therefore, they were genuinely at the point of greatest ignorance. They really didn't know. Okay, so how, you know, they, need, they needed some features for the, some of the new functionality from SQL Server. So I think it was the replication logic. So they asked me, should we use the Microsoft model of replication and hook into that, and it'll take a little bit of time to you know, engineer it, or should we hand roll our own replication? Now, obviously, it sounds like hand rolling your own replication is a really bad option, except that they had some very particular requirements. And it may have been that the SQL Server stuff was not going to be the right way to do it. And, well, the whole point is, we didn't know. I didn't know. I'm not a SQL Server guy. I, you know. Databases, well, that's just one big global variable. Um, you know, so, sorry for any DBAs out there. So, um, so you, you know, that's not my domain. I'm familiar enough with them, but I'm no more than a tourist. Um, um, and the, the point is, neither did they. That was a really key, I said, so they're, they're, they're pushing, which, which way should we do? Well, what do you think? I don't know. What do you think? Well, none of us knows. We are at the point of greatest ignorance here. Okay, let's work this another way. Do you have to do the migration at the beginning? No. Do you have to put this functionality in at the beginning? No. Right. Good. Okay. But we've got to have it done in four months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So should we do it next week? No, no, no. Hang on. Hang on. Slow down. 16 weeks. So how long would it take us if we were just going to do the Microsoft way? No, no, no. One or two weeks. Okay. Let's guess at that. And how long do you reckon it might take if you had to hand roll what you were doing, a very simple replication mechanism. And, um, and, and so they said, oh, maybe five weeks. You know, so I said, okay, well, let's call that six. And let's make sure that we don't put anything in the last two weeks of development. So let's work backwards. End of development, 16 weeks' time. Two weeks as buffer at the end. And then another six weeks. That puts it eight weeks from the end, which is eight weeks from now. And I was at this point in time, at the, at the inception of this work, in eight weeks' time, we perceive that as the last responsible moment. Because at that point, we still have our options open. We can go one route or the other, and it won't impact the schedule. And I also said there's another thing here is we're not just putting it off. Because you may actually discover, in the meantime, because at this point, I think only two of the team had any SQL Server experience, and that was on the Friday before I arrived. That was it. So the point of maximum ignorance really was a very good way of characterizing this. I said, by that point, you will have had six or seven team members working with SQL Server for eight weeks apiece. You will now understand the way of the Microsoft thinking in this. You will understand the tool as a whole. You may have had the opportunity to, to experiment. In fact, I insist you have the opportunity to experiment. So by the time you arrive at this last responsible moment, you'll be able to determine whether it genuinely is the last responsible moment, whether your decision has already been taken for you, or whether you need to do some more work. At that, so in other words, you have not eight weeks in which you're not going to do anything. You have eight weeks of other work. Trust me, there's no shortage of work here. There's other things that need to be done. But that would be the right time to do that. But they wanted, and their classic, the project manager kept pushing me, wanted this decision as soon as possible. And I said, none of us is qualified. So this is why I think that this term, rather than optimal exercise point, is actually perhaps the better one, because it does talk about responsibility. I'm not responsible for that. None of the team were responsible for that. We did not have enough knowledge to be responsible. And so structuring in terms of uncertainty and working backwards. You may find you use this kind of structuring. Now, Chris Matz has done some comics on Agile Journal. Yes, comics, you heard me right. 
to try and illustrate real options thinking, um, little little sequences. Um, uh, these are quite fun. Um, and funnily enough, he uses one of the examples that I've used in the past for figuring out how am I going to get home? If I stay for another drink, then that means that the, uh, the, train, the last train will go, but I could catch the last train if it's a quick drink, otherwise I'll have to take a taxi. And you're looking at your options at every single point in time, evaluating how much one, each one will effectively cost you in terms of time, effort, and money. So what we're looking at here is this ability to live with ambiguity. And I've put the full dictionary definition up there for a very simple reason. Human beings dislike ambiguity. They, um, in fact, particularly people with engineering mentalities, it turns out, are actually pretty bad at dealing with ambiguity. And if you're um, people who tend to vote right wing rather than left wing, are pretty bad at dealing with ambiguity. So, if you are a right wing engineer, you could, you, 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 this is so. This needs drilling into you, all right? Okay. Um, so. The idea is that there is something that is not clearly defined. We are not sure. There is more than one interpretation of the facts available. This is the standard state of being. This is normal. Not lack of knowledge about the pizza is the standard state of existence. Humans love the idea of certainty, but actually we have these little islands of certainty and seas of uncertainty. This is the normal state of being. So we might as well favor a process and an architectural outlook that takes us from the code detail to the big picture that is based on the idea of appreciating uncertainty where we can and accommodating that. We can use this as a very effective tool. Again, let's pick something else. Modeling. So with um, uh, one, uh, one client, I was there at the inception of a project. I'm going to kick this one off. Going to try and teach them some <coughs> TDD. We're going um, to try and teach them some modeling. We're going to try and talk about architecture. We're going to talk about patterns and so on. And we did the structure in terms of alternating um, introductory material, you know, sort of talk material, and then we'd apply it to their system. Okay, so we're actually going to do workshop their system and actually use that as the advantage. Now, what was interesting, we had 12 people, split them into three groups, and originally the project manager envisaged the idea that they might um, focus on um, three different things to explore so that they did this in parallel. You know, let's treat it as a productivity exercise. And I said, no, 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 why don't we do it some other way? Why don't we do have all three work on the same thing? Then we can compare it. Then we can highlight the differences. And at that point, you'll get some feedback. Yeah, feedback very important. So we did this, and this was fascinating. Because in the first group, there was one particular domain term. We were all new. I was new to the domain. These guys were new to the domain. We were all in a similar position. <coughs> there was one term they modeled it one way. I didn't think about this in, in any way, shape, or form. It was being interesting. The next group, the same term, was modeled in a different way, led to a different architecture. The third group were busy debating strongly which of these two interpretations was appropriate. So this is fascinating, is the fact that they had uncovered the ambiguity, but we'd done it across groups. With either the first or the second group, we wouldn't have done it. But actually having the combined knowledge would have made it clear just between the first and second group. But the third group were the people to discover it. That notion of we do, this term is being interpreted in one of two ways. Which way is it? Now, when you encounter an ambiguous term, the term may be as simple as client. The term may be invoice. It can be a term that looks so ordinary you'd never seek to question it. And then you suddenly discover that people are doing two things with it. When you discover these terms, that can help you clarify your model. You'll you use this proactively. In fact, the key to this as a technique, never use the word on its own. Once you've discovered an ambiguous word, never use it on its own. Don't say, we have decided this word means this, because somebody else will misinterpret that. Always qualify the word with a full clarification. So there's a way of doing that. Now, when we look at the structural point of view, when we look at this question of a piece of code, by client, I don't mean client as in client server, I mean client as in a piece of code using another piece of code. We have two implementations of something. When we are caught between these, what we should do is entertain the uncertainty and introduce this. This is not speculation. What we're doing is we're going to say, we will provide a simple wrap or a simple interface that can be fulfilled in one of two ways. Because we are not sure. And it's not because we're not, we're not, not just because we're guessing, it's because we actually have evaluated both possibilities. 
I mean, we can see that option A is looking pretty good today, but the fact that we spent so long evaluating them and trading them off of one another means that in future that could change. The fact that we are having the discussion is an indication of a possible point of instability. This is nothing new. This is also captured in the original information hiding paper by Parnas. This is in 1972. We have tried to demonstrate by these examples that it is almost always incorrect to begin the decomposition of a system into modules on the basis of a flowchart. So he's talking about modular design in the most general sense. We can apply this to classes, packages, or, or larger scale modules. We propose instead that one begins with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions which are likely to change. They're difficult because they are uncertain. They are likely to change because they are uncertain because the things around them could influence the way that you do things. It could be as simple as do I use an array or in a collection? Or do I use that framework or that framework? Each module is then designed to hide such a decision from the others. This is very old stuff, and yet it is exactly the principle we're talking about here. And so that also highlights this idea of stability. We can look at stability as an indication of uncertainty. If something is stable over time, that is a, can be correlated in many cases with we are certain about it. This is a known thing. It's a known known. If it keeps changing, then what we need to do is rearrange things so that the known knowns stay there and the unknown knowns keep wandering along there. They, they're separated out. We, we align our architecture with the kind of lines of change. So this means that we are taking a historical context. Now, one of the um, techniques, you can find this in the big ball of mud pattern, but it also uh, um, relates to Yes, good. Um, this is taken from Stuart Brand's book, How Buildings Learn, and that itself uh, elaborates on an idea by the architect uh, Frank Duffy, which is the idea that um, office buildings, structural, um, functional structures, are structured in terms of, or, uh, most effectively structured in terms of ordered layers of change. The most stable thing is the site. Upon that, you then place the structure, which is the next most stable thing. So where a building is, it's likely to be more stable than the actual load-bearing structure. Then you have the skin, the facade of a building. That's more likely to change than, say, the actual load-bearing structure. Then the services. And I think there's something like for office buildings, typically the uh, skin may, be, may evolve over a 30-year period. Services are such as uh, water, gas, electricity, ethernet, whatever, is going to change on a roughly seven to 15 year life cycles. Then the space plan, partitioning, and then the stuff within it. There's a rate of change. And what you want to do is you want to make your architecture sympathetic to this rate of change. This is one of the reasons that office buildings typically have services easily accessible through ceilings or through floors or through um, uh, paneled walls. You don't really want to have your services underneath and embedded in a concrete floor. Yeah? This is a, a bad idea. It means that you are looking for the rate of change to indicate stability. Now, what does this mean for code? What it means for code, don't, don't take the six S's and try and apply them to code. That, that, that's kind of like, that's a bit too literal. Yeah, it's da da da. Uh, you walk away from NDC, right, Monday morning you go in, right, we're going to have a six S architecture. <sighs> what? All right, we're going to organize it. Right, but, but it's a perfectly happy four layer architecture at the moment, right? Well, first of all, everything has to begin with S and we're going to make four six. No. That's too literal. What we're looking for is where the relationships, this is also one of these things that's been discovered time and again from different sources. Uh, Uncle Bob refers to this as the stable dependencies principle. You wish to have a piece of code depend on something that is more stable conceptually than the piece of code that's using it. So therefore, if it's less stable, it changes. This needs to change. You want to order your structure like this. So shearing layers or time-ordered layering as it's known, is one of these ideas of putting things together that change together and that are stable with respect to one another and depend on things that are more stable. It tells you where to put your interfaces. This is an analysis done in the mid-90s of some code at uh, Bell Labs. And rate of change is indicated by color. So red hot, fast changing, blue, very cold, slow changing. And what you can see is that the yeah, this is actually reasonably well-factored code because oh, it's not showing the actual dependencies, but what they have is that things that should change together, on the whole, are together. Yeah, this same color, same color, you know, same color range, same color, same color range. You, what you don't really want is what you've got here, 
See, all the colours are represented in there. That tells you that you need to factor that into at least two different parts with respect to the rate of change. Of course, this is historical data. You may say, well, how do I do this in advance? Another idea that Alan O'Callaghan uh, explored in um, Legacy Systems and is also taken from that Stuart Brand book, scenario buffering. What you do is, this is how to use speculation. Speculation is a powerful tool. But what you do is you think, how could this system change? You evaluate possible futures. You don't choose one. What you do is you sum over the possible futures. You figure out. So let's have a look at this. Let's do this by a dot vote. So you have some package arrangement. You've got a class depending on another class. And then you pick up some possible future things. Maybe they're in your product backlog. Maybe they're known knowns in this case. Or maybe you do blue sky envisioning. You figure out, you know, what people might do in five years' time with this system. What they might do in two years' time. Or a possible requirement. Maybe they will need that persistence requirement we talked about. You envision the possible requirements. You don't change the code. What you do is you pretty much dot vote. You have some representation. You go and put a cross or a sticker. And you say, right, if I were doing this change, I'd need to touch that and that. If I were doing this change, I need to touch that. If I were doing this change, I need to touch that. If I were doing this change, I'd touch that, that, and that. So you sum over a set of possible changes. And this gives you a probabilistic view of the system. Now, what this says of, of how the system might change. So this is probabilistic. This is like weather forecasts. This is not an act of concrete prediction. So given that we have just evaluated eight possible changes, this is the least stable thing, yet everything depends on this. This is more stable than this, so we're going to reverse it. So what you do here is you restructure the code accordingly by inverting the dependency. But you do this, you can do this based on historical data, but as I indicated before, but you can actually do this as a speculation exercise. The goal is not to change the things in the interfaces. It's not to change the code necessarily. It's to rearrange the code sympathetically with the anticipated change. Of course, you could be wrong. But according to this, if you've got a reasonably even-handed um, approach, then you've got a 75% chance that this is a better fit than this. And you've done so in a reasonable and rational manner. Another way of looking for things that we don't know. Defects. Yeah, A bug is an unknown. Yeah, when somebody sort of says, it's really unknown. Yeah, if you get a bug, how long is it going to take you to fix it? <sighs> oh, I don't know. Let me think. It took me 30 minutes to put it in. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's sitting there on the plan. Yeah, we've got this much of my week is going to be taken up coding. And, uh, and this much is going to be taken up debugging. This much is going to be taken up n-bugging. Yeah, this is a term Andy Hunt of the pragmatic programmers used, n-bugging. Yeah, if you debug taking bugs out, n-bugging is putting them in. Um, lovely term. But the point here is that, uh, a bug is an indication of uncertainty. We didn't know it was there. We didn't plan it. It's an unknown. We are genuinely surprised by it. I can't give you a reasonable estimate, but I can do something with the presence. So here we can look at this and we can say, all right, look. Okay, look, this is pretty, all the bugs are being reported in there, or the majority of bugs are being reported in there. Of course, you have to be very careful about interpreting the defects. It may be that D, maybe that the code genuinely sucks. It was written badly. Okay? Okay, that may be an indicator. The important thing with any metric is to understand the metric is telling you, is not answering a question. The metric is posing a question. And the question is, what's wrong here? We don't yet know. Maybe this was genuinely badly written. Maybe D is actually quite large. So the defect density per thousand lines is the same as everywhere else. It just happens there's an awful lot in D. Maybe it's because we genuinely don't know, back to the orders of ignorance, what's wrong in A, B, C, because D is most commonly used, and there's a bunch of uncertainty around these. It's just that this is so frequently used that we understand the bugs. So this is an indication of knowledge. This is actually a reflection of ignorance. Oh, no, 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 we haven't really explored A. Eh? We don't use it much. There's untouched functionality in there. Yeah, there's unexecuted parts of code. We genuinely don't know. But because it's not used much, we have less knowledge of its bugs. It may also be that D, my favorite interpretation, it may also be that the problem is in F. The interface to F is error prone and clumsy. Yeah? Most buffer, un uh, buffer overruns happen because of awkward uh, legacy C interfaces. Now you can say that the bug is in the code, or you can say the bug is in the interface design. I prefer the bug is in the interface design. It causes this problem. It leads to this. 
But whichever way we interpret it, it indicates something that we need to do. If this is too big, we can break it up. If this is being caused, the problems in this are being caused by this, then we need to put a barrier of certainty in there. In other words, introduce a simple wrapper that is definite and clear, lacks this kind of uh, uncertainty or error proneness, and presents something robust. Right, now on that note, uh, let's go back to comics again. This one I do have. There's a slightly different ending. Have you seen the watch film Watchmen? They have a slightly different ending. This line is in the film, but it's at a different point. I'd almost forgotten the excitement of not knowing the delights of uncertainty. And hopefully I've convinced you that the fact that you don't know what's for lunch is now an opportunity and not a problem. Okay? Thank you very much for your time.